subhead for just about any topic we could pick if we're going to talk about the U.S. mobile market. Um, this, is a very, um, this is a very interesting time uh, to, to be living in, and I don't mean that only in the Chinese curse kind of way. Um, messaging, let's say just a couple comments and throw out some data points about messaging to ground our discussion. Then we're going to come at it from a couple different directions, and we're going to try to open it up to questions um, from you, the audience here, in, uh, in short order. Um, sounds like a great demo next door, doesn't it? <laughs> sounds like the uh, electric light parade thing they do at Disneyland. <laughs> so I, if, if, you, if you look at the core thing that phones uh, are, are good for, or let me put it a different way, the reason why people are so attached to them, I would suggest that it's because it helps them connect. Helps them connect with other people. Increasingly, we're seeing these connections be of a different sort, connecting with brands, connecting with content. And that connection, it, it used to be just about voice, but now it's clearly much more than that. Um, a couple numbers here. In the U.S., in, in the month of March, about 40% of U.S. mobile phone owners age 13 and above sent a text message. Right? Um, that's up from what would have been just about 30% um, two years ago. So we're seeing growth there. One of the biggest sort of success stories in mobile content uh, services, value-added services, data services, whatever, over the last two years um, has certainly been picture messaging, photo messaging, MMS. In the, the data that we collect every month, it goes up every month. Uh, and we now are living in, in, a, in a market in the U.S. where more than half of people have a phone that's got a camera on it. So it's not just about voice. It's not just about text. Um, it's also about things like I am. Uh, that's an area, if we look at, at text messaging, and I, I throw out that 40% number and I'm in London, I'll get laughed at. Uh, because in the UK, that number is like 86%, right? If we talk about mobile IM, what we'll see is we'll see something different, right? We'll see, in fact, that the U.S. has higher I, mobile IM penetration. Uh, it stands at about 6.6%. Uh, that's not quite 14 million people uh, in a month uh, versus a, a lower 3 in Germany, 45 about in the U.K., my point here is just to, to underscore the fact that these markets are very different. It's not a case of the U.S. being ahead or behind. And what we're seeing happen in the U.S. market with messaging, what our panelists are going to help illuminate here, um, is a lot of movement in a lot of directions, some opportunity, and also, as we'll call out, um, I'd say perhaps some market risks. So to my left, uh, Steve Granick, he's vice president of IP services business development at Newstar. How many of you know about Newstar? Curious what you know about him, because I thought I knew a little bit about him until we started talking about an hour ago. Um, New Star, on, on the one hand, is Switzerland, right? They help provision things like short codes. We'll talk about that. I also learned that they're the largest um, provider of operator branded instant messaging services in the world. That was a new one for me. So Steve's eminently qualified to talk to us about messaging. And I guess what I'd like to start with, Steve, is if, as we look at the broad landscape, and let's focus on the U.S. market for the moment, um, what's the state of the messaging market? The interoperability that we know is so critical to get services to take off, new service introduction, and, and so on. Well, and we've just been joined by a fourth panelist. Fantastic. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, I would say that uh, obviously. Um, we're still a voice-centric world, and, and you know, I, I think it's important to remember the voice is a kind of messaging, too. Um, it's just much more immediate. Um, so most messaging is still a voice, obviously, in the U.S., but SMS has taken off quite a bit. The interoperability is, is, is um, uh, um, unexamined for voice. It's assumed for voice. You just assume that you can call somebody. Uh, SMS, we pretty much are at the point where we think Odds are we're going to get a message delivered in the U.S. Um, there is more dropped on the floor than a lot of people like to talk about. Um, and that's got to do with some real basic routing problems of, you know, uh, the reality is that the databases that sit in the middle that route voice calls were designed to route voice calls. They weren't designed to send SMSs. They weren't, certainly weren't designed to send MMSs. Um, and as a result, you really don't have addressing information in those databases other than to route a voice call. So, and most part, you can fool the databases, you know, 98% of the time, 95% of the time into getting the right answer. But as the market changes a lot, and you, you, you see, you know, people like Virgin, 
you know, that, that, that launch a site which uses somebody else's network for voice but may operate its own infrastructure, well, golly, then you have to figure out an end around to fool it. So there's some interoperability challenges, and I believe they will get more and more challenging without a much more sophisticated addressing database in the middle. And I think that uh, why that's important uh, to uh, a, an audience that's focused on the entertainment space and the premium part of the market, it's one thing for a carrier to, uh, to drop a message occasionally between you and I. You know, gee, uh, are you around? You know, I say something like that. It's entirely another thing to drop a message that, uh, that there was 50 cents involved in, which was going to get divided between the two parties, not to mention the fact that as a result of it getting dropped, the consumer that you're trying to train to trust that channel of delivery kind of doesn't know that he can trust it anymore. So this 5% of, of routing problems that are part of the interoperability, I think have a much more profound effect than people realize immediately with money, but also in terms of creating friction. So is that a, a reasonable answer? Yeah, and I think it's a really good answer. I think that, that, that the notion that, um, you know, it doesn't matter so much if, if my message to you gets dropped on the floor, but as we start to move into business models that depend on the delivery message or where there's a premium, um, that becomes an issue, and that's a good segue to, to meet uh, Dorian Porter, who's sitting uh, just to your left, who's a founder and CEO of uh, Moses. You might have seen um, uh, their, their ad in the MES thing, and, and, and as far as I can tell, what Moses is doing is, is a pretty interesting and unique approach to harness messaging, but also kind of, um, uh, I think, build on what we see as a lot of interest and enthusiasm for people uh, and, and, and uh, uh, companies, et cetera, to kind of run the show and to create their own content and to build their own audiences. And Dorian, maybe if you could flesh that out and tell us what you're up to at Moses and, and how you see in 2007 um, the opportunities for messaging-based businesses like your own in sure. the US. So I think we're definitely in the early stages of kind of application-centric messaging, uh, whereas a lot of the SMS text messaging data that gets thrown around is person-to-person, -person, so texting to your friend, texting to your spouse, texting to your mom, um, you know, that's going on big way and then last year and obviously this year we're seeing more uh, businesses like ours and others and large businesses start to think how can we use the messaging platform as a way to connect the consumers with things like commerce or with in our case uh, musical artists um, so what Moses does is provide an internet based platform to allow uh, an artist or band to create a mobile marketing campaign if you will to really connect with that fan using initially messaging and the web, uh, although we have a much bigger vision around the kind of tool set that we could offer to people, we chose text messaging and the web because both in the United States are ubiquitously available, uh, commonly used, and certainly within a demographic that bands are going after the 14 to 27 year olds, uh, text messaging is extremely popular, much higher than 40% usage in that particular demographic. Um, and so for us, it's really about, you know, being at those early stages and figuring out how we the platform that's going to be uh, utilized and build those connections and you know we're doing some fascinating things from you know backstage pass contests live in venues so that fans can use their mobile phone to use text messaging to have a chance to win uh, backstage passes at the concert right there and then to having one of our bands we have a band called hell yeah that sent a message out you know to its permission based mobile fan club saying you know who has the uh, most rocking grandma grab your phone take a picture of your grandma and back to us, and I think that that kind of activity uh, is pretty amazing because, you know, today most of the activity when we talk about connecting people electronically, it's about being, you know, hunched back at a computer connecting online, and now of course this mobile phone opens the opportunity to have one party, in this case the band, sit at the internet, but reach all of its fans in the moment and within literally minutes have hundreds of photos sent back to them uh, of their grandma live is pretty fascinating stuff. And Going on in terms of human connection, which is what you opened up with. So I think as we move into the space of application-centric or internet-centric messaging use cases beyond person-to-person, -person, you know, there's not only huge opportunity, but I'm sure we'll get to some of the challenges associated with it as well. Great, thanks very much. Um, so, to your left is Jared Wrightson, and, and, and Jared is the CEO and founder of MobileStorm which does end-to-end -end digital marketing, right? So a lot of email-based marketing. My understanding of I guess the question um, that I'd like to lead off with is, as you're out there, and you've got a pretty, you can, you can tell us about some of your clients, but they're brand names. From 
uh, uh, how is mobile, again, let's focus on the U.S. market to begin with, how is mobile in the consciousness of those brands? Is it, is it something that they're coming to you and asking for as part of this mix you're providing? Is it something you're still in the, the education phase with them? Maybe you could, could speak yeah. to where the, the, the brands are at. We've kind of had an interesting ride, actually. Um, I founded the company in 99, actually focused on mobile, hence the name Mobile Storm, and actually on the music industry, which is, is funny because, uh, you know, Dorney over here is, is really focused on that now. Um, we created actually one of the first mobile projects for the music industry called My Music Mobile, which actually, if any of you can remember Avant Go, you could, like, take the content with you on your handheld and go somewhere. Well, that wasn't really mobile in the true sense of the word today, where you could send text messages and think it with a computer and go somewhere. Um, we couldn't get, uh, the, the, cl the client at the time was Interscope, Geffen a we actually couldn't get them to purchase messages. Um, our model is actually in delivering multiple types of digital messages, email, voice, fax, um, uh, you know, RSS feeds, things of this nature. We couldn't get Interscope to actually purchase messages back then. Um, it's just amazing, though, to see sort of where the market has gone from 99, um, which I guess sort of anybody uh, an idea in the mobile space could, could have raised $5 million back then um, and then would have sort of flamed uh, out pretty quickly there. Um, but, you know, to see sort of how the mobile space has progressed, you now have people willing to pay for messages sent. Um, and something else that, that you were kind of mentioning about the, the, the portability um, and interoperability in terms of being able to make sure messages get delivered, coming from the email world, where we've delivered over a billion emails um, for, on behalf of brands like Carl's Jr. and, and and, and uh, Amp Mobile, you know, these businesses, $59 billion a year is lost because emails aren't delivered into the inbox. And so you see a, me a medium like text messaging coming up where, you know, in interoperability is getting better. Um, I, I, you know, for the most part, unless you're out of coverage or you're out of service, um, you're going to get that message to your phone. There's a pretty good chance. And so I think a lot of what, to answer your question, a lot of these marketers are now starting to see mobile as a way of um, two is making sure the message gets there, um, but two, we all understand the psychology of mobile is completely different um, than receiving an email. You know, when, you're, when, you're, when your pocket buzzes, you, it buzzes. What email buzzes you? Unless, of course, you have a Blackberry, but you guys get my point. You pull it out, <laughs> oh, who's trying to get a hold of me? You look at your phone, and it's just a completely unique experience. And so I think a lot of these brands are really starting to realize um, the types of messaging they need to be doing and sort of where the value lies, and I know that um, companies now are actually willing to spend money, willing to, uh, I still think they're hesitant to throw big marketing dollars. I still think a lot of these things like mobile search is starting to happen and, and content being delivered to the phone. I still think, you know, we need to have the handset and the adoption, but they're really starting to spend money and they're starting to realize that these are very viable channels and it's a lot easier to get their, their content delivered and, and not going to be filtered by a spam, you know, anti-spam filter, so on and so forth. Well, that's the theme we'll, we'll return to in a minute because uh, um, I think there's a risk in a, in a big way, but um, so moving on there at the end of the table, um, um, you're going to have to help me here because I may mispronounce, but Marcian Jenks. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, who comes to us from AOL, SVP of Messaging and Social Media. I noticed that title's changed over the last year, um, I think, to encompass the social media concept, which, you know, if you think about I am, it's pretty social media even before we coined the term. Mm -hmm. So um, lots of usage, not just of I am with AIM branded services in mobile in the U.S. What have you seen in the last, say, looking backwards 24 months and, and now looking forward a little bit uh, about the, the nature of the mobile market and how, it, and how it maps onto or is different from what you see on the Internet? Sure. Uh, so, thanks. Sorry I was a little bit late. Um, the, um, you know, it, probably the biggest question that I got when I uh, first uh, took over AOL's messaging business include both AIM and ICQ is, you know, what about an interop with Yahoo and MSN? And while I still get that question a little bit, um, for me that's actually much less important as kind of true interop with the mobile carriers. On, uh, on any given day, we deliver uh, more than 100 million messages uh, to um, a handset, uh, to a phone, uh, whether it's kind of from one handset to another through our kind of uh, rich IM network or whether from uh, desktop to, uh, to SMS. Uh, and the biggest thing that keeps me um, awake at night is how 
we continue to be relevant to our users, um, kind of wherever they are and on whatever device they are. Uh, is that 100 million, is that a global figure? Yeah, 100 million is actually just the U.S., so it doesn't even wow. account uh, what we do outside of the U.S. It's, uh, it's an you know, immense amount of uh, traffic that both kind of represents the scale of, uh, of messaging business, uh, but also the importance of uh, mobile outlet to it. Uh, so in terms of the themes and the things that uh, we see happening, I see uh, the lines blurring between kind of traditional desktop computer messaging and SMS. Uh, you know, if you kind of look at the products, you have, um, you know, two different things. You have uh, IM, which traditionally allows you to have a much more robust experience with a lot more capabilities in real time. And then you have SMS, which does only a little bit of that, but is uh, much easier to use, right? You don't have to launch a client, that type of thing. And so I really see by um, the end of this year kind of a lot of progress in kind of blurring those lines further through things like presence-enabled address books. Uh, you know, certainly we're committed to be leaders in that space uh, and would like to, by the end of the year, have uh, a significant uh, number of presence-enabled address books out in the marketplace. Um, the second thing is, and this is just uh, some of the points that were recently made, um, there's a value from putting uh, SMS and IM networks together, specifically around the concept of, of presence, knowing when somebody is available, and also the concept of privacy, allowing somebody to kind of uh, manage the messages that they're getting, and also the kind of their contact list in a way that they can deliver messages. Uh, so those, I'd say, are the two um, uh, biggest things that I'm looking forward to in uh, the coming 12 months, uh, really aggressively getting out there through presence-enabled address books and uh, further pulling together the SMS networks and the uh, uh, traditional IM networks to deliver great experiences for consumers. That's great. A lot of fodder for discussion here. I, I want to begin by doing a little poll here. So how <coughs> many of you um, use uh, mobile IM regularly? How many of you use uh, work email regularly. Right. I want to point out you're a really weird bunch of people. And this is something that I often find at mobile conferences because we have to be very careful not to think that we're the average user because, in fact, what we see when we look at the data is that mobile IM use outstrips mobile work email usage. Right? Just not among us. It, it, and, and, and I think particularly if you're talking about messaging, it's really important not to um, think everything's about the Blackberry. A few years ago, I, I called it, it was the, the CEO trio fallacy, which was every company that was designing a mobile app, they started with the trio because that's what the CEO owned, and they thought that it was the greatest thing in the world, and that was the way the world worked, and, and it totally didn't, didn't represent the, the, the mass market. Um, so a question, a question for you, and, I, and there's a, a lot to play with here. Um, you, um, Marcian, talked about this idea that there, uh, and I want to understand a little better. So I get it. The whole idea of availability or non-availability, does that move into kind of a whitelist, blacklist kind of world with SMS then? Um, I mean, <clears throat> it could. I mean, ultimately, you know, a, a lot of uh, the experiences that we try to create for, uh, for consumers, not just us, everybody, tries to put as much control in the consumer's hand as possible because uh, that will ultimately drive usage and adoption of, uh, of the products, right? The consumers want things on their, on, on their terms. But even at a of much simpler level, right? Uh, two of the other panelists mentioned the, the kind of um, drop in deliver, uh, drops in delivery of SMS, and um, it is, you know, it is a bit of an issue, right? If you send someone an SMS, you're not sure that their phone is on. You're not sure that they're in range. You're not sure that, you know, they can actually step away from whatever it is they're doing mm -hmm. to kind of engage with that SMS. And those are things uh, kind of in other places, certainly on the desktop, consumers have figured out a way to solve for, right? Um, a great example is uh, just with a name. So again, just name, just U.S. Uh, consumers set <coughs> 82 million away messages a day, right? So 82 million times during a day, a consumer has actually gone into their desktop application and said, you know, I'm not available or I'm going to the cafeteria or I'm gone for the next two hours and, you know, I'll get back to you then. And so that concept of being able to project status 
uh, to project presence is a very powerful one and one that I see kind of appearing in you know other tools that consumers use. Steve, you look like you want to jump yeah, in on this I, one. I, I, yeah, I really want to. I want to pile on and underline that. Um, you know, we obviously uh, we have the most experience about this issue in Europe. And I'm, I'm, I'm frankly, we bought the company, so I'm only, I'm once removed from the guys who really experienced it. But what they tell me um, is, is that in, until you have presence on a mobile phone, you don't know what's hit you. You know, it is, it is positively a transforming experience. You know, and, and, and you don't think about it because, because even I am for many people on a desktop is just kind of part of the environment. Hmm. On a mobile environment, it's the whole environment when you surrender to it, and it transforms the way that you interact with the world um, in a very powerful way for the consumer. And actually, interestingly enough, for the operators as well, because what you discover is that people think, well, if you know that, you're going to send less messages. Exactly the opposite happens. Exactly the opposite. It's much chattier, much chattier, and often, by the way, good for carriers, results in a phone call. So it's really an incredibly powerful environment, which we kind of read about academically. We hear about presence a lot, and we, you know, especially people in the room probably mm -hmm. hear about it a lot. You know, again, we're an odd group. But, but until you really experience it, and we haven't yet for the most part, you don't understand wh what happens to you. And um, which is, by the way, why one of the reasons I think that you asked me about the state of messaging, mm -hmm. I think it does migrate to an I am centric like world here. For, uh, there's also economic reasons to do that, but, but just because of that power, I think that that's where we're going. So for, for media people that are interested in that, I think it behooves you to begin to think about you know, stirring presence into the kind of campaigns you're dealing with. Cisco talks about subscribe to a person in some of their stuff now. Think about subscribing to a person you know, as, as the metaphor. You know, uh, th that's a very powerful yeah. way to think so about it. So no that. question. I mean, that when I talk about the buddy list, that everyone's familiar with the buddy list, all the buddy list is is a subscription to a bunch of people. So you get to see the stuff about them. And or a service. Yeah, sometimes it's a service. Service. yeah, it could be a bot, but right. to the, um, you know, a lot of the product innovation that we've done in the last year is to kind of extend that metaphor of subscription to a person, right? So you can now associate RSS feeds around your web activity with your screen name mm -hmm. and essentially project out to everybody who's subscribed to you around all the things that you've done online. Incredibly powerful concept, I agree. Also incredibly powerful if you, if you th think about like doing that and then, if you will, mashing it up with some of the service kinds of things that you're talking about. Sure. Now, suddenly, what I'm subscribing to is subscribing to your view of a service that you get. Sure. So it's not just, you know, it, mm -hmm. it starts to get really interesting. Jared looked like he was. Uh, yeah, coming. just to point out, you know, obviously, a lot of us know the word <coughs> location based services. We're talking about presence. Um, a lot of the bigger brands that, that we have are, are really excited about that, for this, especially like, I'll just give you an example, let's say you're MGM Grand or Palms Hotel Casino in Vegas and you get off the plane and they know you're in Vegas, your presence is there and you get a message and it says, hey, you know, $15 free slot play, come down to the casino and, and you know, come to the cashier, show your phone or get it scanned or any of these, any of these other technologies for re redemption and, um, you know, now they sort of have you. It, the, Obviously, the per, there's a, there has to be permission based on that. A lot of times people freak out and go, oh, privacy, privacy. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's if you're a brand and you want to opt somebody in and they're willing to receive those messages from you, I think it's going to be one of the most powerful things that, we, that, that mobile can, can have. And I'm just, you know, I don't, I, 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 maybe one of you guys can answer this for me. I see it coming. Um, you know, with the E911 bills, there's things of that nature in terms of emergency use. But, you know, when is the real marketing application is going to open up, uh, you know, who's going to be leading that forefront and how can I plug that into my platform? <laughs> now, are you talking about LBS in, in particular or, or, or well, yeah, presence I mean, more broadly or? I, well, I guess both maybe. I mean, LB, LBS from a, you know, triangulation, like where are you and opening that up for marketing applications. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll add to this, on this presence idea. I mean, I love what um, you were saying on, on the AOL side of how it may be coming at the end of this year. but. You know, we chose text messaging for a reason because it was easy to explain to the publisher, so the record label or the band, hey, send text messages out to your fans, to their mobile phones. And we know that in some regards, the window will close on that idea. And I, I I'm certainly don't believe it will close this year, probably not next year. I kind of look to five to ten years out before that SMS kind of communication subscription uh, idea closes on text messaging. 
Um, because I can't imagine being in a record label office tomorrow and explaining how you're going to subscribe to that update that's going to get published through the IM system. You know, they, e even the new media person would be, this sounds really cool, but I can't explain it to anyone else, so we're going to hold on that. Um, so I just wonder at what point um, we're going to be able to get to those kinds of ideas. And I think there's a lot of shakeout that's going to happen, both in terms of, you know, I, I, I'm a, I would be one of the first ones to adopt you know, address book presence, I have no idea how I can do that, and I am one of these strange, you know, weird guys in the room that should know how to do that. Well, I mean, I think if we, if there's any truism about the mobile world, it's that it always moves much slower than everybody wants it to, <laughs> right? And it's, <laughs> so I, but I mean, I, I do think, I mean, I, the presence is something that's been talked about for many years, and I do think that uh, one of the things that I see is, I mean, the speed of innovation on the, the internet right now, the last couple of years has been Phenomenal. I mean, it, the internet got fun again, right? And I, and I, I, I personally have a sense that we're going to see that accelerate what happens in mobile. But let me ask you a question. Could, um, do you want to buy credit, that? You got to yeah. credit broadband for a lot of that. And I Absolutely. Think that, yeah. And I think that that is the number one issue facing mobile. But, the uh, idea that I, you know, I was, yeah. I went to a conference on the wrong day the other day, and I opened my mobile browser to find out what conference I should be at at what time. But I stopped that, and I just called someone who I knew and knew the answer. And if that's the test, <laughs> that just to find out a simple thing like what day is this conference on versus calling on the mobile browser, we just have a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I uh, appreciate that. It is worth noting, I mean, 3G, uh, 3G does look like a hockey stick uh, in terms of 3G adoption in the U.S. You know, I think that's um, the case. I, you know, I had a, um, um, a conversation, uh, messaging, uh, and to your point that it's not going, uh, SMS isn't going away, you know, anytime soon, even though... Uh, people are going to have, I think, an enhanced experience uh, that might blur the line. But, in, uh, you know, of all the panels, you talk, we can talk about video, we can talk about all this stuff. And I was talking with someone at a very large CPG company um, recently who just wanted to pull her hair out because she's been very, you know, she's like, I wish we would stop talking about this future stuff and talk about what we got now. What we got now is messaging. And, and, but to your point, Jared, right, I mean, it made me feel a little bit getting off the plane in, in Vegas and getting bombarded with an offer, thinking about like Tom Cruise Minority Report when he's yeah. walking past the talking ads. Mm -hmm. we, what we've seen in the U.S. and the most recent day we have is, no, is in November, but um, nearly 25 percent of the people that received an SMS solicitation said it came from a company that they didn't give any permission to. So it was spam. So what I heard you say is mo one of the reasons mobile is attractive is unlike email these days, there's no junk mail folder. Um, but I'm wondering if, if you know, what are thoughts on how we make sure that we don't have a spam problem in mobile? Because um, uh, that's something I think that would be, um, uh, you know, would stunt the growth of, of what's a, a pretty vibrant young industry. It, it would. Um, I think one of the simplest factors to point out is that if you look at the internet and, and spam, there's thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of different people that can deliver messages through a network, whether it's being trafficked through AOL, which takes the brunt of a lot of the spam. Um, uh, or, you know, some small little ISP down the street from your house, I, I think that mobile is, is a bigger, spam is a bigger problem for mobile because it could end up costing that person 15 cents, right? Or at least dig into their plan. Um, so if you get an email and it's, it's an email, it's spam, it's knowing you just delete it, but it, that doesn't necessarily cost you money, but th there's two obviously bigger, big, you know, there's a big factor with mobile in getting spam, but I also think that it's a lot more controlled, meaning very few carriers that control the pipes. And so you talk about 12 carriers versus th hundreds of thousands of people that could send messages. And I think carriers can stop stuff faster um, and they can put controls on them. Don't, I don't think necessarily think those controls are there yet. I think they're working on them. They do have obviously the ability to, um, we've seen a lot of, uh, we see even with the government coming out with this with issue of people sending um, emails to cell phones as a form of an S SMTP message. And then all those domains now you can't send to. So there's ways of cutting that off. Um, you know, true anti-spam filter sense of the word is, I think, I think carries are ways away, but at least there's less of them to control that. That's a Has Newstar seeing any, any of that kind of, try? I mean, it, w w short codes, right? I mean, I guess this is also a question for Dorian. What I'm curious about, part of what I understand the Moses solution is um, you have a short code and then there's keywords that can be uh, acquired underneath it. Right. What's... Uh, 
pushback from carriers that, I mean, in, in this country, they, they've, the, the shortcut approval process is not lightning fast. <laughs> right. Um, any issues about, you know, acceptability well, of the us, content? For us, it's about building programs that get approved by the carriers. So we do take steps. So, for example, we abide by obscenity <laughs> and things like that. So if someone messages with a swear word, we block that out. And our, our approvals are based on keywords and programs associated with keywords. And so, you know, you can't get and just do whatever you want, charge nine ninety nine to someone, et cetera, uh, unless it's part of a program that's been approved. Uh, but part of the opportunity we saw, I think we saw three things in mobile that said there was a big opportunity. Um, number one, that the cost of experimentation for brands and others, especially a band, uh, was exceptionally high for results that were unknown. So mm -hmm. trying to drive down that cost of experimentation uh, in permission-based ways was important, which is the second point, which is this idea that permission-based marketing was something that is the future. I mean, no one can advertise on my Google inbox, even though there are a bunch of RSS feeds, you know, my iGoogle page, there are RSS feeds that I subscribe to, no one can spam that space. You know, I subscribe, I can turn off and on things. So Moses, you know, was designed to be a permission-based, subscription-based service on the mobile phone. And then thirdly, what we saw in the mobile realm was that, uh, and I actually will say on that second point in terms of spam, you know, one of the record execs we worked with told me that we were the first mobile company, these are just mobile alerts, right? Out messages from bands to fans. They've experimented with tens of companies, you know, throughout the last three years, four years. Some charge money, some don't. And I was told by an exec that signed up with us that we were the first company ever that he signed up for one of our bands and didn't get a spam message. And that kind of shows the state of the market with mobile companies out there just trying to find ways to build their business, et cetera, in a, spam, in a spammy way. Uh, and then the third thing was that a lot of the mobile stuff is just very mobile centric. And yet, I think many of us recognize the future that it's internet centric and this idea of you know being able to get uh, an alert or a photo or a video to your phone uh, and maybe not having time to watch that video or read that message it's nice to know that when you get home you could actually read that message on your computer screen and or stream that video to your large screen so you know we see a future at Mo Moses where we might push a WAP video out to the handsets of phones and yeah it's cool to watch it in the moment because you're the kid that wants to see that video the second it gets released but it's also important at home, you can show your friends on the big screen TV as well. Well, you know, and, and I, I believe in, in either conversation we've had just now or, or prior to this, every one of you has had a, a, a vision or products that straddle the internet and straddle mobile. And I, I don't think that would have been the case three years ago in terms of the people that would be speaking at a mobile conference. And frankly, I think it's really healthy. There's, there's, there's no way that, that we, uh, this group isn't going to just keep talking, but I want to make sure we save a little time for questions in the audience. So um, are there any questions? I think we I don't know if we have an official timekeeper here, but I think about maybe 10 minutes. There's a microphone right up here, I think, which if you wouldn't mind walking up there because I think that's important for the audio video capture. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to let you know that, that I, he is not a shill for New Star, although, but if you want to know about short codes, he's the guy. <laughs> Kyle, Kyle runs the short code registry for New Star, so. So my question is for Mark, because you're a stats guy, right? Um, so of the 200 million phones out there, how many are using SMS, how many are using IM today? Wow, I don't have that written down, um, and I don't, don't memorize all the statistics. Um, what, I'd, what I'd say is that in the U.S. market, uh, right, the number, it's just under 40 percent, right, versus about 6.6 percent IM. Now, that's, that's an audience metric, so that's not, a, a, that's not necessarily a number of messages, and that's the number of uh, people that sent an email, or sorry, excuse me, sent an IM at least once, sent a text message um, at least once. To, to provide a little comparison there, um, if you look at, say, games, right, which gets a lot of press and discussion, um, depending on the month, it's, it's kind of seasonal, but somewhere around 3% um, of the population uh, downloads a new game, right, in the month. Uh, and about, you know, 8 or 9% may play a game, and about 10% download a ringtone. You know, the IM is, uh, and, and, and on the video front, it's about um, uh, overall, if you talk about programmed video, like stuff people trying to sell you, it's about uh, a 1.3%. Uh, so so what, do we, what do we know there? In terms of non-voice services, the big kahuna is text messaging, right? IM, though, it has a bigger monthly audience, um, uh, you know, much bigger than video, um, double the size 
people that download a game, a um, little less than the number of people that download a ringtone. That's the, I can, give you, I can give you the actual okay. numbers later, so but that's. What, um, sorry, one other just uh, thing to add there is that, uh, you know, from a reach perspective, 80% uh, of the handsets that are out there in the U.S. can actually launch an AIM client. So that, you know, the actual usage numbers are exactly right, but from a, from kind of a reach perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in the last two years, you know, owing to the handset replacement cycle, blah, 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 blah. I mean, in the last two years for things, for, for texting, for IM, for mobile web or web, whatever the heck you want to call it, their mainstream majority capabilities now, it's, 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 no, it's no longer something that only a small amount of people can do, right? But you had a, a follow-up question there? Yeah, so um, my question for the panel is, you know, I almost, I've been in wireless for a long time, and I almost feel like we've been down this road before. You know, um, engineers have developed, you know, some pretty fancy packet data networks and services to go along with that, but what did, what did consumers come back to? I mean, you know, text, and which basically grew out of paging, Right, um, two um, two-way messaging or two-way paging, essentially, which is SMS, was adopted by the consumer, even though there were these much fancier solutions out there, inclusive of packet data network, mobile email. You know, what am I what am I doing? Two-way messaging or mobile email or or SMS or what? The consumer came back to something that they're extremely comfortable with. I mean, we we had alerts back in the '90s, you know, trying to push out horoscopes and weather and whatever else. It never it didn't take until I think. You know, you got the common short code and compatibility between the carriers and where you could have a nationwide call to action, et cetera. And I would just say, you know, shouldn't we be careful a little bit about over-engineering a solution as an industry and expect that the consumer is going to step up and, and use it? So that's my last uh, question. So, so I think 100% we should be careful about, you know, a couple of very good points on that front have just... Uh, has just been, have just been made. Ten years ago, I uh, worked uh, with a European carrier to build out a global mobile portal, and I remember at the time, you know, the big question that we kept asking ourselves is like, right, so what's the killer app on a phone? And the answer is pretty straightforward. It was voice, and it still is. Um, and I, I think the biggest challenge in terms of the new products that we introduce is they have to be seamless and simple to use for consumers and they have to mirror behavior that already happens with consumers. Um, and I'd say SMS is at that level, and I think, it, you know, of course I'm biased, but the promise of IM in terms of a rich SMS experience is that, you know, just in our products, 80 million people a month on a global basis are using our desktop messaging product very aggressively, and all those people want to be reached on a, um, a set as well and we've had a lot of success with the carriers essentially connecting those products in a way that ultimately drives usage so there's a lot of aligned incentives around it um, so so I would agree with you I think that beyond text messaging you know there's there's kind of challenges the good thing though is that every 10 years we've certainly advanced so it might take 10 years till we're all sitting here talking about how we watch television on our phones it probably will take um, but in the meantime, uh, I think there's uh, certainly major opportunities around messaging. We see those today. So that's yeah. real. Dorian, do you want, want to comment? Well, I just want to say that I think, you know, the idea that SMS is the basic service, I do believe that that's a limitation of the network. Uh, MySpace and Facebook are essentially messaging services. They're just much richer messaging. I can see photos. I can see their latest videos so that I can comment on it. It's one big messaging network. And I think the vision for mobile messaging is similar such that, I, yes, I want be able to communicate with someone and tell my friend something, but being able to see their photo, learning where they are, understanding what they just listened to as a song is all relevant to that future messaging experience. So I do think there is some, you know, engineering slowness, if you will, to what we are, what the vision is. Mm -hmm. User-generated content, I think, is a killer app on the phone because you could be anywhere and, you know, as long again, as long as the networks, okay. as long as we have 3G and and you know we can do all these things, you could be anywhere and just generate great content and. Yeah. I, I know, the, over the, I am. The, the other thing I want to underline is is that you, you, this is really goes to, against what you said. You said the network is, is 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 still relatively weak, and it is. People forget that. The other thing is there's been very little innovation uh, effective um, around uh, around UI, uh, be, partly because you have such a lockdown environment. Right. And 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 that's also part of the limitation. I mean, you know, yeah. what you've got to do, frankly, even to send an SMS is pathetic. You know, uh, and now it's amazing to me that people put up with it.
But that's, yeah, I guess we, we got to see what kind of phone we'll he's got. So we'll see. Well, we'll let's, go, let's go to another question uh, here. So. Just a useful one. <laughs> so, uh, since we're in Hollywood, I was wondering, <laughs> besides you know, things like American Idol, what other interesting or innovative types of apps should the studios and the networks be doing with messaging? Um, I, I think that, uh, it, 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 for me, it goes to the subscribe to uh, thing. It's a really simple one. But, I mean, if you think about, you know, there, there's, um, uh, you know, there's the guys in your bands, you know, and then there's the guys in your bands, the persona. And for me, you know, I'm, I'm a guitar player, you know, or at least it was in my day. So, like, for me, to feel like I had a relationship with Eric Clapton would be cool, you know, or with a movie star. So you see some hints of this where you could subscribe to somebody's interests, but you're really not subscribing to them because you don't really have a personal relationship. But you are sort of, you have a feel like you got a connection to them. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there. You can see, I think some of that was short codes already in a very basic sense, but if you think about it in a little richer sense, you know, like what is uh, this guy reading this week? I mean, I think there's some, there's some real, you know, simple ways that you can create connection so, between between personalities. Yeah, so and let's just go down the line. Here. So, so how else should Hollywood or broadly the entertainment industry be, be using messaging to connect? Orion, do you have an opinion on that? I bet you it involves Moses. No, it doesn't have to involve <laughs> I think the idea that the mobile phone can be the action vehicle for people in a way that never existed before. So American Idol, while well, mocked, is the idea that we are engaging an audience in real time mm -hmm. in, in an event or, or activity. And that just that notion has... Any creative person in Hollywood should be able to come up with limitless things you can do with a television program and people sitting at home in their mobile phones wanting to be engaged, desiring to have that connection and to take action. And so obviously it's going to eventually be used for commerce and being able to take action to information or buy stuff and that will all come down the pipe. Uh, but just that idea of audience engagement is so important uh, and, and so fundamentally a difference between what's existed before in terms of watching a program. All right, Jared? Uh, it's funny, I, my office is on Sunset. I had to drive right past the Kodak <laughs> Theater to uh, where American Idol is. Um, and you would think I'd have some sort of great, amazing, hey, this new technology is coming out and it's going to be wonderful. But I'm going to actually say something pretty boring. Um, I think what Hollywood needs to do is they need to just start building databases um, and, and building their subscriber base and getting permission so that as the phone advances and you can be a director and make movies and all these things that we know and love, they'll have a channel to be able to just quickly communicate and, and quickly push those services down. And I, you know, I, I tell people this all the time, it's like just start collecting cell phone numbers. Start doing it everywhere you can. On, I mean, you see it now with American Idol, obviously, as a voting way, but you know, just any on, on flyers, on, on television, on radio, on every, every current channel that you, that you possibly can, can touch the consumer, build your database, get permission um, so that you can push some really cool things. So the uh, only thing that I'll add is um, a, I would look at extending uh, the relationship from what is now a one-way transaction, right, someone voting on American Idol, to what can be a two-way transaction, right? So there's nothing preventing anybody actually building bots that live on the network today that actually allow consumer interaction via short code or something else with any type of functionality, you name it, inclusive of pinging my schedule. Where am I supposed to be right now? And having the current message actually uh, come right back to you. Uh, you can do that on an IM network, and you can do that certainly through an IM network to, uh, to a carrier network, and I would expect that soon you should just do it on a carrier network. That's good. Another question? Um, Mark, you started by talking about picture messaging, saying mm -hmm. that it was growing pretty well, mm -hmm. and, but I haven't heard anything back from the panel talking about, you know, is it going to be used? It's one first example of user-generated content, isn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, uh, my question is to the panel is that what do you think about picture messaging and how are you, do you intend to include it in maybe even in IM or, or other services that you think about? And uh, what's the future of that? And just one question. What's the percentage of users of picture messaging when you were talking about that growing? And the U.S. is about 15% right now. 15%? Sent a photo message at least once in a month. Wow, thank you. Who knew that stat? Yeah, yeah I know a lot of them. I just got to make sure I don't confuse them. I think it might actually be like 14.8, but, you know, who's counting? 18% Latino and... Uh, I, I mean, I... It I, actually I skews... Can you, the, the, I, I well. can tell you, from what we see with messaging is that, um, that, that uh, MMS, I think, was going to be the next coming, you know, when 
came out, and it didn't quite come the way people expected. Um, and I personally think that while it will continue to grow and become useful, I think over time it will, it will really become subsumed into MMS. And I mentioned before that I think there's economic reasons for that, much more that have more to do with the carriers than with the operators. When, be, 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 and it's simply because an IM infrastructure does everything. You can do everything you can do with all everything else in an IM infrastructure. And by the way, including making it look like it's traditional SMS for an end user. So you can, even with the same experience, but you can do it for like 150th, you know, 150th of the price. It's so much cheaper for the operators to operate. So I think you're going to see picture messages get subsumed into that. Like, of course, you can send a multimedia message as part of the way you're interacting with something. Of course. But I mean, consumers, you know, there are probably few things they care less about than the underlying technology right. standards that sit behind these mobile services, right? So how about from a consumer standpoint, what, right. what are you seeing? How does that, I think it fits into what, what you're yeah. up to. Well, I think it's still early for the application-centric uh, programs because I think people really get right now how to send a message to their best friend or to their mom. Uh, I think that's pretty straightforward. I enter the mobile number and it shows up and what, wasn't that great? Uh, a lot of companies are obviously circling around this kind of one-to-many notion. I can post it to my Flickr account or I can send it, broadcast it out to our friends. Uh, in my example where, you know, the band said that they go take a picture of your grandma and send it back to us, you know, send it, it was not send it to my phone, it was send it back to this Moses application. That confuses a lot of users. A lot of users don't understand that you know, to send an MMS to an application, they may need to use an email address, and even though that option may exist on their phone, they don't know how to access it. So I think, you know, we're probably another year away before we start seeing consumer understanding of, how, and it's going to take applications and some carrier ideas, et cetera, to get consumers into more mass adoption of application-centric photo uses, but I, obviously the, the person-to-person -person stuff is, is strong and getting stronger. I think, I think, Steve, you're right. I mean, I think it costs you 25 cents to send a message you know, it's, it, consumers aren't going to do it. I think that, that cost needs to come down quite a bit. Um, and, you know, I think you'll see a lot more adoption. Great. So is, um, we're, we're slightly past the allotted time for this panel. We did start a little late. If there's another question in the audience, I'll entertain it because I don't see them coming out with a big hook yet. <laughs> Although they're clapping next door, so maybe they're closed. Any other final questions? Great. Well, I'd like to just thank you for your attention and ask you to join me in thanking our panelists for a rousing discussion. Thank you.